gospel. So that was the gospel that Paul was preaching. He had his own understanding of what the gospel is so that he can call it my gospel. And according to him, that was the main point of the gospel, that Jesus died for the sins of human beings. Now the gospels which were written were all written after Paul. This is the ones that we have in the New Testament today. You have four gospels written by, uh, for convenience, we say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because we don't know who these people are exactly and we call them by the traditional names that they have been called Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. All of these four writings came after Paul and so they're imbued with the ideas which are there from Paul and all of them try to explain in some way or another why Jesus had to die for the sins of the world. Now this becomes a very difficult problem and so they go on with a variety of explanations. According to three of these Gospels, Jesus was not willing to die on the cross. According to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, he was begging God up until the very last moment to save him from the cross. It is said that the night before he was arrested to be put on the cross, Jesus was praying. He was praying and he was asking God, God, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. In other words, according to this, Jesus didn't want to go ahead with this. He can see that death awaits him. He knows that they will come at any moment and try to arrest him and crucify him. And he doesn't want this to happen. He's asking God to come up with something else. Let there be some other way of dealing with this. But let Jesus not have to go through with this. According to one of these Gospels, the Gospel according to Luke, an angel came down from heaven, actually two angels to strengthen him, perhaps to give him more resolve. But even after that it says in the Gospel of Luke that his sweat were like great drops of blood. So much he was in agony over what awaited. He didn't want to go through with it according to Matthew, Mark and Luke. So much so that according to Matthew and Mark, two of these Gospels, even after Jesus was put on the cross, when he was about to die, he finally said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it shows that right up to the very end, he didn't want to go through with it. He was not a willing participant in this scheme. So this presents a problem. If God is determining to let the innocent people go free, and he's crucifying Jesus instead, it would have helped matters if Jesus was willing. The fact that Jesus is not willing makes it look very bad on God. How? Because you have to imagine the scenario. It is as though God has before him a bunch of criminals. God is like a judge having the criminals and the judge says to the criminals, Criminals, I love you. Go free. But he says, Somebody has to die because that's the law. For the criminals to go free, somebody has to pay the price. So who's going to pay the price? Guards, bring my son. And then the guards come in bringing the son. And the son comes down on his knees and he says, Father, please, is there no other way? Please, Father, think of something fast. Let it not happen like this. I'll go along with what you say, Father, but please, isn't there some other way? The father says, no son, sorry, you got to die. That's the law. Criminals, I love you, go free. You see, it doesn't look very good on God if Jesus is not a willing participant in this scheme by which God wants to forgive the people. And so the fourth gospel, the one which was last to be written, sends this problem and tried to deal with this particular problem. You must realize that the gospels initially when they were written were written as separate individual documents and they were circulated in different lands. Eventually, people thought it uh, better to compile all of these Gospels into one single book. And so they compiled them, they collected them from various regions, compiled them into one single book. But prior to that, they were circulated individually. So those who read Mark's Gospel did not know what was in Matthew's Gospel. And those who read Luke did not know what is going to be in John. So finally, when John is writing his Gospel, this is about now 70 years after Jesus had already been taken up into heaven. John wants to make sure that he gets over this problem. 
It should not appear in John's Gospel as though Jesus is not willing to go ahead with this because this makes him look very much like a human being and it makes it look very bad on God that God has this unwilling participant in this whole scheme. So according to John's Gospel then, Jesus was quite willing. That from the very start, Jesus already knew he was the Lamb of God who came to die for the sins of the world. From the very start, it is said in John's Gospel that uh, Yahya or John the Baptist already declared that this is the Lamb of God who came to die for the sins of the world. So Jesus must have known it and everybody must have known it right from the very start. According to this gospel then Jesus declares that he is willing to go ahead and die for the sins of the world. He said for example in this gospel that I am the shepherd who dies for his sheep. He says nobody can take my life away from me. Because I've been given authority to lay down my life and I've been given authority to take it back up again. In this last gospel, Jesus appears much more powerful than he used to appear. He's no longer the weak human being that was praying to God, asking God to take this cup away from me. Now he's a powerful individual. He's almost like a divine being walking the surface of the earth or perhaps even floating above the surface of the earth. And so he does not pray here to be saved from the cross. But rather he makes it quite clear that he's going willingly. And he says, nobody can take my life away from me. I've been given authority to lay down my life. And I've been given authority to take it back up again. As if he's going to be resurrected by his own might, by his own power eventually. Eventually when he's to be arrested, according to this gospel, he comes out and powerfully gives himself up to be arrested. So that when he finally is put on the cross and he's about to die, now you remember what he said according to some other gospels. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in this gospel he doesn't say any such thing because that would make him appear weak, it would make him appear unwilling. And it would make him appear as though he was forsaken. That he was hoping for something else than what eventually happened. So according to this gospel, he doesn't say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Instead, he says, it is finished. And then he finally dies. As though you have here a picture of a man who was trying to accomplish something. And then finally when it is accomplished, he says, it is finished. And then he lets his soul go out. As though he actually came into the world specifically for this, to die for the sins of the world. Now today when many Christians read the Bible, they remember Jesus as the willing participant, as the one who deliberately came into the world to die for the sins of the world. They do not remember that he was an unwilling participant according to the other three Gospels. You see the story has been reworked in order to make Jesus appear a little differently than he appeared in the other three Gospels. So now he appears willing and he goes through with this whole scheme. If he appears willing, well then this makes it look a little bit better on God. See, that's how the story has been revised. Now, if Jesus appears willing, then we can have a different scenario. We no longer have the scenario of the judge who wants to let the criminals go free. And he says, bring my son. And the son comes in weeping, crying and praying. Now you have a situation where the judge is willing to let the criminals die. And he says, criminals, you've got to die. That's the rule. But the son comes in and says, Father, I have pity on these people. Let them go and I will die in their stead. And this is the image that many of the preachers and evangelists really love. They love this image because it makes better for an image of God and of Jesus. So now, God all only has to say, okay, criminals, you go free because somebody else has offered to die in your place. And God then perhaps is not so happy crucifying his son, but because the son has offered, God goes ahead and lets it happen that way. Now this makes it look better for God according to this revised story. However, this does not free the story of all of its problems. Because once you say that Jesus died for the sins of the world, even if you said it this way, you still have a major difficulty. And the difficulty has been this. If Jesus and whom be peace can come in, and have compassion for the people. And he can say, Father, let them go, because I feel sorry for them. If Jesus can have that much compassion, 
Why couldn't the father himself have that much compassion, even more? Why couldn't he have said to the people, people, you can go free. Because if you sin, that doesn't hurt me. And I don't want to hurt you, I'll let you go free. Now it appears that Jesus has more compassion than what the father had. The father appears like a very stern judge. He's willing to demand blood. But Jesus comes in as a loving, caring individual, willing to shed his own blood in order that the father should be happy and the people should go free. Now as a result of this imagery, it is quite true, if everyone would search their hearts, that Christians love Jesus more than they love the Father. And why should that be so? In fact, the Bible throughout, from beginning to end, calls on people to love God. And the Quran calls on believers to love God more than anything else. The Quran says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ Those who believe love God more than anything else. Or they are more severe in their love for God. So why should it be that people love Jesus more than they love the Father? But it is a reality. This is what has happened. And I'm not the first one to make this point. A Christian writer by the name of William Ellery Channing in the 19th century has already made this point in one of his writings, saying that indeed Christians love Jesus more than the Father. So that that love which they should have had for the Father has been displaced and redirected towards Jesus. Yes, indeed, the idea that Jesus died for the sins of the world is riddled with problems. First of all, we've seen that this runs contrary to the majority teaching of the Bible. The Bible from beginning to end, before the writings of St. Paul, has been telling people that you don't need someone to die for your sins, that nobody dies for your sins. Jesus, in whom be peace himself, came and taught people a number of things which all add up to the same simple fact, that nobody dies for your sins. In order for you to be forgiven, you turn back to God and you ask Him for forgiveness and He shall forgive you. But if you say that Jesus died for your sins, then you run to another... You see, uh, he, many people saw Him because of the way He spoke, that He could simply contradict the Lord and set it aside. He never did that. For instance, He was accused of breaking the Sabbath. He never broke the Sabbath, not even once. He what he did, he healed on the Sabbath, he did the works of God on the Sabbath, which in the mind of some of the Jews, the leaders at that time, any sort of activity was breaking the Sabbath. Jesus pointed out this was not so. He, does, well, he was not breaking the Sabbath, he was breaking their rules, which is something quite different. Their rules, not God's. But he did not come to arbitrarily set the law aside. He fulfilled it by dying. And when you read what Paul says in the full context, Paul shows that he did that, he, he put the law aside, as it were, by fulfilling it. He agrees with Jesus, but abolished, the, the effect was to put it aside or to abolish it, but not in the way that some would assume at the, when Jesus was speaking. So we have to read those two, two statements in, in, in context. Thank you. Two minutes for the Shabir to comment on that. Well, I must uh, start off by saying, um, Mr. Forward, I don't understand your answer because on the one hand, you've agreed that uh, the, uh, Jesus said he did not come to abolish and Paul said that he did abolish. Now you said that the two things appear opposite, but they are not opposite because they have two different meanings. But the meanings which you explain doesn't seem to be any different. Uh, it, it is still quite clear that Jesus, from what he said, it made it plain that he didn't come to abolish the law. He kept the Sabbath. He still insisted the law should be kept. And on the other hand, Paul taught people that uh, the law is abolished. Uh, so in what sense then is it different? I'll, I'll have you explain that a little further and then I can respond because I didn't understand your answer. Again, perhaps I can give an illustration. If I have if I'm fined, say, for a parking ticket, which does sometimes happen to me, I can simply say, tear up the ticket, and in a sense I've set it aside, I haven't fulfilled it. But if I pay the fine, or somehow I'll, 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 perhaps go to court and 
plead that I wasn't there at the time when the ticket was written, whatever. I have not abolished what was there. I haven't just arbitrarily set it aside. I have fulfilled it by paying the fine or proving my innocence. But in another sense, speaking in another sense, I could say later on, well, that's put aside. And we have to be very careful, as I say, about the context. Paul is not contradicting Jesus by saying he abolished the law. Paul makes it very clear. For instance, what Paul says is something that Jesus also says. See, Jesus said he came to, uh, to uh, create a new covenant. Now that prophecy about the new covenant was, was prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus came to the earth. It was a prophecy given by Jeremiah. And it was God through Jeremiah who said that he would, he would uh, write a new covenant and, and put uh, all of us really, but he starts with, of course, with the nation of Israel by putting them under a new covenant. And uh, he says um, uh, in, um, in Jeremiah 30, 33, I believe it is, he, he says, um, uh, the days, uh, uh, thus says the Lord, if you break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time. Then he says, um, uh, the days will come, he says, when I will create, have a new covenant with the house of Israel, not according to the old covenant, which you, which you uh, previously broke. He says, I'll write my law in your hearts. Now, this, this was something which Jesus refers to because on the night of his betrayal, he is, he refers to that new covenant, he says, this is given to you for the new covenant, he refers to it. Now, why is he speaking of a new covenant? Because he knows very well that the old covenant is set aside. You see, you can't have two covenants in existence. The new covenant sets the old aside. I had the same situation with a mortgage. I had a mortgage in my house, I sold the house and had a new mortgage. But when I, the new mortgage set the old one aside. I, wasn't, I, I didn't have two mortgages on the same house. The old one was set aside by the new. So Jesus clearly indicates that there would be a putting aside of the old covenant, the old Mosaic law. Paul simply explains in detail how that is done. He says in, in, um, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, he, he says this. He says, he says, remember that you were at that time, speaking of the Gentiles, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strange to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. So it was the enmity of the law that was abolished. And it's true, he, Jesus did in one sense abolish it, but he, what I tried to explain was he did not abolish it in the sense of simply arbitrarily putting it aside. He fulfilled it and in that way he abolished it or put it aside. The, 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 the two, in other words, we're talking of two ways of abolishing. One simply by setting it aside and without doing anything. The other affecting the abolishment by fulfillment. Thank you. Okay. Now for my response. It is clear that uh, after hearing the, uh, uh, Mr. Forward's answer a second time, that uh, we're nowhere different than where we started. It is quite obvious that Jesus said one thing and Paul said the other thing. Jesus said, I have not come to abolish. Paul said he did abolish. From what Mr. Foward has explained, Jesus did not abolish the law at all. Uh, he insisted that it must be kept. He said that you must keep every one of the commandments, big or small. It is possible also to have two covenants. Yes, you can also have two mortgages on a house. You can have a first and you can have a second. The passage from Jeremiah does not say that the first commandment will be abolished at all. Uh, it speaks about a new commandment coming into effect, but it doesn't say the first one will be abolished or will be cancelled. So when Jesus said, I'm instituting a new covenant, 
uh, that has to be taken in line with what Jesus already said meaning that the old commandment is still valid. He said, whoever will break even one of the smallest of these laws and teach others to do the same will be called smallest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever will practice any one of these commandments will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus maintained circumcision. He maintained the distinction between clean and unclean foods. But Paul did not maintain this distinction. Paul said circumcision doesn't matter and uncircumcision doesn't matter. Paul said you can eat what you want because all foods are clean, whereas Jesus and his disciples after him maintain that distinction. Yes, Jesus said one thing and Paul did say the other thing. Even after hearing Mr. Foward's answer for the second time, I am still convinced that this is the case. Paul said that Jesus broke, according to what Mr. Foward has just read, Jesus, sorry, that Jesus abolished the law with all its commandments and regulations. On the other hand, we know that Jesus kept the commandments and regulations according to what Mr. Foward himself had admitted before. Thank you. Uh, brothers, uh, respected guests, uh, sisters, please keep uh, the questions on the same topic. Did Jesus, peace be upon him, die for the sins of the world? Because we have all kinds of questions that does not really go align with the subject. Okay, just uh, let's just browse through this one. Was Jesus a Jew or non-Jew? What color was he? Well, Jesus was clearly a Jew and he had to be a Jew. He, he, he's called, by the way, uh, he, he's never in the Bible called the son of Mary. He is called the son of David. And it was very important that he be a descendant of David. So he was certainly a Jew of the tribe of Judah, by the way, which is what the word Jew comes from that because he was of the tribe of Judah. Uh, so I, I certainly uh, uh, would say that uh, he was a Jew, most definitely. Just one other very brief point in reply to what Shabir said. The, uh, Jesus certainly did not break any of the commandments because he was under the law which was in effect until his own death. It was his own death that made it possible to put a